global sustainability and resilience of which our urban studies program is a part. And uh, we didn't know what to expect when we sent out the an announcement for this program, but we had so many people accept we decided the larger room would be a little bit more comfortable. And fortunately, we do have a comfortable amount of time for discussion. Um, I, I, uh, before I go too much further, I want to thank um, our colleagues with the Wilson Center's Asia program. And in terms of actually making today's event possible, Allison Garland and Thea Cook have been instrumental. Uh, I also want to thank the, the speakers for making the effort to get here. I'm not going to formally introduce them. We have biographical material uh, available in the handout, so I, I'm, I'm going to save, uh, save time. But I do want to thank, the, the fact that I'm not going on to, uh, to say uh, extensive remarks about each speaker, I want each of the speakers to know we really appreciate your being here. But I did want to uh, take a little bit of the small amount of time available to me to um, really thank the USAID Alumni Association. Uh, we learned earlier this year that the association had decided to focus their energies during um, the upcoming uh, several months around a series of workshops focusing on urbanization and broader issues of development. And uh, we're very pleased to hear that uh, because uh, we at the Wilson Center have been trying to work our way through some of the complex issues uh, relating to urbanization and development uh, for a while. And we were especially pleased because it seemed to us to be an indication that a broader community is beginning to notice that urbanization needs to be brought into the conversation. And in May, uh, w we hosted a, a meeting which the association organized on Africa uh, agriculture, structural change, and the urban imperative. So we are very pleased uh, that we are able to participate again in the second meeting of the Asian cities. Uh, Owen and Alex, um, Owen Soke and Alex uh, Shokar are really uh, wonderful organizers. I can't say enough about the efforts that they put in to make this meeting possible. And uh, for us, it, it really has been a, a great relationship, and I want to thank, thank them both very much. And with that, I think I'm going to turn the floor over to Owen, who's going to be um, moderating the oh, No, I'd say for Chris. Uh, Warren. Oh. Warren will be, okay. It's all yours. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, it's great to have an opportunity to, uh, to open this session, and uh, uh, to see a lot of old friends. I've had the opportunity the last year uh, to spend a great deal of time thinking about what the world might look like in uh, 2025 and 2030, um, and in particular, because I'm from the World Bank, what the World Bank might be doing then. Um, if, you, if you look at the world in 2025 and 2030, it's very clear that two issues are going to uh, drive the world in either a good direction uh, or very likely a bad direction. Uh, and one of those big issues are cities. Um, and I'm going to throw out some numbers here in a minute just to kind of set the stage for, for where the world might be going uh, in terms of urban development. Um, and the second issue, of course, is, is what I call the woolly mammoth in the room, which is climate change. Um, so first what I'd like to do is, is have you imagine a world without climate change um, and think about cities. So uh, and let me just throw a few numbers out here. Uh, the, the tidal shift of, of rural to urban uh, in Asia is going to continue. Uh, Asia's population will increase by about 50% within the next generation. Uh, and a very, very large percentage of that increase, uh, and the current population will end up in cities. In the 50s, about 232 million people, or 17 percent of uh, Asians, lived in cities. In the next 55 years, up to 2005, uh, the urban population grew nearly sevenfold to over 1.5 billion, or about 40 percent of the total population. Uh, by 2020, 
that'll be about 2.2 billion or 70 percent, and, and that will include about 70 percent of the world's poor people. So 70 percent of the world's poor people are going to live in Asian cities by about 2020, and by 2030, uh, there will be a, an urban population of about 2.7 billion, um, and, or about 55 percent of the population of Asia. This is an increase of 70 percent, uh, 1.1 billion in the next 25 to 30 years. Um, so that's the future, and those numbers are mind-boggling. Uh, when you compare uh, to, to past history, there is no comparison. The, er the rate of urban growth is just not comparable to anything we've experienced. Now, the, the, a big, big part of the problem is that the urban situation today is already pretty bleak when you look at the what I call the development gap, if you're talking to a lot of the adapt climate change adaptation folks, they call it the adaptation gap. But the reality is that there's a huge infrastructure gap uh, and services gap, urban services gap, in the existing cities. And that gap needs to be filled. And the, the, those who are responsible for providing the infrastructure and the services are going to have to provide additional facilities, jobs, health care, education, and so on, for about 120,000 people every month, additional people every month. Uh, the, the stress on urban services is already being felt in many of Asia's cities, um, and this is, you can see this in terms of poverty, security, and in particular in, in terms of the degraded environment. Uh, environmental quality in many of Asia's uh, existing cities is, uh, is on a, uh, has been pretty bad, and, and instead of getting better, is actually getting worse in many cases. Uh, the, uh, uh, the bulk of Asia's economic activity, and as everyone here knows, Asia is where the bulk of the world's economic activity has been, uh, is in cities. Uh, the cities generate about three-quarters of the, a the annual national economic output, uh, and about one-half and two-thirds of the exports in East Asia. In, in East Asia. Uh, a single city is a primary economic center in a number of, of countries, Bangkok, 40 percent of Thailand's GDP, Manila, 30 percent of Philippine GDP, Ho Chi Minh City, 20 percent, Shanghai, 11 percent. And in China, 120 cities account for three-quarters of the total national output. So cities are key for, for the economic growth that we've seen taking place and will continue to see taking place uh, leading the world in terms of economic growth. By about 2025, 18 out of the world's 30 megacities, uh, and these are cities at that time, they'll have populations over 14 million, 18 of the 30 will be in Asia, and about another 300 million inhabitants will live in 45 cities with populations over 5 million people. So we're going to see a, a growth in megacities and a growth in, in uh, medium-sized, large, medium-sized cities, but the greatest growth will be, actually be in small cities, and so we, it's not safe to just focus on one. Now, they, it's one thing for uh, filling the infrastructure gap, and it's very concerning to me that there's very poor information on what that gap is, what it will cost to fill it. Uh, we've been trying to generate some numbers with, with very little success at the, from, from the ground up. Uh, and there, so there's, but we know that there are trillions required to fill the, the urban infrastructure gap in the next 20 years or so. Uh, at the same time, because of the the economic growth in the cities, uh, we, we're seeing a, a much greater uh, separation between the rural and urban uh, ability to spend. And, and in fact, urbanites consume about twice as much as rural folks uh, at, on average. And we're going to see, uh, McKinsey estimates, we'll see about 600 million new consumers living in about 440 cities over the next 20 years, and most of these will, many of these will be in Asia. Uh, the increase in per capita disposal income, the increase in consumption of energy, water, generation of waste, uh, all will present massive demands on, on urban managers in the future. Uh, and these are, again, situations where they're not able to meet today's problems, let alone how will they, wondering how they will face uh, tomorrow's problems is, is a big issue. Um, there are estimates that demand for food will go up by about 40% in Asia from 2000 to 2050, and 
Mike might have the numbers, but energy is somewhere, the increase will be about 50%, I think, uh, in terms of energy demand. Uh, now, I'm not, I don't want to tread on anybody else's turf, but I, I do want to mention one uh, number that I really like, and that's the building stock that's going to be built in, uh, in China alone. Uh, in the last 15 years, it's quadrupled, the urban building stock. Um, and in the, in the next 20 years, the uh, Ministry of Construction in China estimates that they'll, they'll have to build about 13 billion square meters more residential floor space. And uh, you can, you know, one, one reference I looked at equated that to, um, to the equivalent of the total floor area of all existing residential buildings in the EU 15 countries. The one I really like is that it basically that's enough concrete to cover uh, Australia. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of concrete. Uh, so the, the consumption is going to be huge, uh, and the impacts on not just waste generated, but also the impacts on uh, renewable resources, extract, extractives, the uh, impacts on ecosystems and ecosystem services are all really mind-boggling. The scale of this problem is, is just so huge, we've, the world has never seen anything like this. Now, kindly put the climate lens over that, and what you see are two key issues. One is the, whatever the trillions are required to fill the infrastructure gap of t the, the gap today and, and meet the future needs is the price tag is going to go up by at least 30 percent to be able to make that infrastructure resilient to the impacts of climate change. And this is particularly true in, in many Asian cities, many coastal cities in Asia in particular, that are going to be uh, affected by sea level rise, storm surge, drought, floods, you name it. And, and virtually every city will be impacted by uh, climate change. Um, the good news is that if the world gets its act together and actually is able to go to scale on dealing with the climate issue, it'll be cities where they actually can, can have the greatest impact in a hurry. Uh, in and by impact, I'm talking about a serious bending of the, of the GHG, the greenhouse gas uh, concentrations in the ambient, uh, ambient concentrations, bending that curve. Uh, cities generate anywhere from 70 to 80 percent of the globe's um, greenhouse gases. And the, you'll see different numbers, and I, to me it doesn't really matter whether it's 70 or 80 or 68. It's a huge part of, of greenhouse gas emissions, and so it's a great opportunity to actually bend the curve by low carbon development uh, and energy efficient buildings and so on. Um, again, the scale is massive. To, to be able to actually have an impact on, the, on GHG emissions that will have an impact on reducing and hopefully avoiding a four degree world, maybe moving us to a 2.5 degree world. Uh, I'm not optimistic about a two degree world, uh, but, the, but th this is an area where a serious impact can actually take place if the world gets its act together and, and goes to scale on pushing low carbon urban development. On the other hand, if it doesn't, then we're almost assured of at least a three degree world by the end of this century, probably three and a half degree world. So uh, cities are, are both the opportunity for the future, but they're also a very, very high risk, and again, at a scale that we've never faced before, and quite frankly, I've seen very little uh, evidence that the, the international community is getting its hands around this, this challenge. So with those opening remarks, um, I want to first invite Peter to uh, follow on, then we'll just go in this order, and then we will open up uh, for discussion. And please, when, when we do that, uh, there will be microphones available. Please use those and, uh, and give your name and affiliation. Thanks. Okay. me. It's quite a pleasure to be here. And what I was charged to do was to take over from Warren and uh, give a little more context to um, some of the case studies that are going to be presented later on. Um, so the title of this uh, talk is uh, Asian Urbanization in Context, and I will 
take off on some of the things that Warren was saying about the scale of urbanization, but then I also want to talk about how complex it is and that what we're experiencing today or what we're seeing today has no analog in the past, as was mentioned also. That, um, and therefore, the policies and the strategies that were used previously may not be tenable in this current situation. And finally, I just want to, my third point is that, again, that will be uh, stressed throughout this panel, I believe, is that cities are crucial um, to uh, the sustainable development policies, social, political, and in, in all realms. Okay, so uh, as uh, I mentioned, when you look at Asia, uh, as was mentioned before, you can um, see larger urban populations than elsewhere. You could see greater numbers of cities with higher populations, meaning that there are more mega cities, as was mentioned. They're of larger size and they have more infrastructure. Um, moreover, as was mentioned, while there is a very significant poor population, there is also a very significant and growing middle class. So consumption um, is rapidly increasing in a number of issues, and I'll try and speak to that. Okay, the first thing I want to point out is that urbanization in general is of a different order of magnitude than it had been when, let's say, Europe and the U.S. were undergoing their urbanization transition. For example, um, between 1750 and 1950 is largely when the quote-unquote West uh, urbanized, and then we moved from about 15 to 423 million people that, that were added to cities. Between 1950 and 2030, in um, the developing world, we're talking about moving from about 300 million to 3.9 or 4 billion people. So you can see the numbers are just uh, tremendous. And of course, Asia has a uh, significant role in this. Here's, you've probably seen this chart before. This just shows you the number of, of urban people in uh, both the developed and the developing world and the, and, uh, the growth, particularly since post-war period of those in uh, developing countries. How uh, uh, much is Asia and the Pacific involved in this? Well, I put some numbers together. Basically, between um, 2010 and 2050, does this have a, yeah. You, we're expecting something like 35 million people to be added to the urban sort of world in this part of the, uh, in this region of the world every year. So that, that's, that's what we can expect. We're talking about annual growth rates of almost uh, uh, one point, uh, I'm sorry, 2% for, for China and 1.6% for uh, the rest of the region. Um, in terms of the numbers of cities, this is all from UN data. Um, this is the growth in the world's megacities. You can see in 1950 there were two, and this is megacities, meaning cities larger than 10 million. By 2000, there were 16, and by 2025, there's supposed to be about um, 29. Of this, um, and here's the populations down here and the percentages, I just want to show you what's going on in Asia. Uh, you know, we're looking at basically half of the large cities in the world, as well as half of those in other categories. Um, and um, sort of nowhere else in the world do we see this as dramatically as China, and I think this is going to be um, emphasized in later, later uh, uh, case studies. So certainly Guangzhou is one of the areas where we've seen massive, massive urbanization. So they moved from something like one a million people to over almost 11 million by, by 2025. Um, moreover, in terms of land use, we've seen massive expansion of urban areas. This is a study that was done or published in 2012, which shows you the size of these cities and how they've grown over the last, whatever, 20, 30 years. Um, this also is a pattern that has not been seen, the massive use of land over short periods of time that has gone urban. Um, and not only are they spreading out, but they're growing taller. I just took this off the web from the Imperius uh, uh, group, and they show you that, you know, whereas if you go to Shanghai, they say, oh, yeah, we want to we wanna build a Manhattan. Well, they've already gone behind, uh, beyond, way beyond that, something like 50, 
53% or 54% of all the skyscrapers in the world are located in this part of the, of, uh, or, or in Asia. And if you look at the tallest 10 structures, of the tallest 10, uh, nine are in Asia. A massive amount of, uh, of infrastructure and cement has, has been uh, noted. <coughs> Um, we can also see this, as I mentioned, in terms of consumption. These are vehicle numbers, and I got this from various uh, years from Ward's Automotive. And what you could see here is that 1985, um, East, South, and Southeast Asia had about 13% of total automobiles, about 62 uh, million. By 2010, we're talking about, what is that, 20? I can't read it from here, 24% or almost a quarter of all automobiles and uh, something like 245 million. Um, moreover, um, sales are increasing rapidly. These are the numbers from 2001 to 2010. Um, and you can see that uh, we have increases of, let's say, whoops, <laughs> about 145% over this 10-year uh, period. And in 19, and tw I'm sorry, 2010, the automobile sales in China exceeded 18 million, which is bigger than any best year in the U.S. And they're going up. So we could expect that to, to continue to rise. Um, and subsequently, and this will be mentioned in much more detail, you can also see uh, the total energy consumption increasing. This is actually total primary energy supply uh, of the OECD compared to Asia, and we could see the, over the last 20 years, uh, massive increases from about 18% uh, to 30% of, of total. Okay, um, and the next point after the scale, as we've seen, is the, the complexity. Now here, um, my view on this is that the transitions that were experienced by the West, by the U.S., by Europe, occurred over long periods of time and occurred in a sequential manner. That's no longer the case. It's very, very difficult to see transitions now. I have uh, debates with colleagues about this, um, and I will try to provide some evidence of that, so that what's happening in any one city is that you'll see, quote, unquote, the 18th century city, the 19th century city, the 20th century city, and the 21st century city, all within a few blocks of each other. Um, and uh, 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 therefore, these patterns are changing the development, the development trajectory, if you will, of these places. And of course, they're due to both the direct and indirect influences, things like everything from local policies to globalization. And subsequently, the, as, I'll, as I'll talk about these transitions have been what I call c compressed, collapsed, and telescoped. So what does this mean? Well, this is a uh, very influential chart that was published in the 60s and 70s and demonstrates what occurred in the U.S. And you could see here these patterns of sort of rise and decline. And here we have there around 1830, 1870, 1920 of different technologies, et cetera, et cetera. And this was uh, identified as part of the evolution of metropolitan America. They're very sequential, as I mentioned, and they happened uh, uh, over long periods of time. This was sort of identified through what was what McGranahan and his, his colleagues called the urban environmental transition. In this case, what you have here is the severity of various environmental problems, like here we have household sanitation, access to water supply, indoor air pollution, and with increasing wealth, we see this decreasing. Then subsequently, we find ambient air pollution, river pollution, these kind of issues. They climb, and then they, de then they decline, sort of following the quote-unquote environmental Kuznets curve. And then there's another set of issues that seem to rise and don't stop, and these include consumption-related, carbon emissions, and these kind of things. McGranahan noted that there were three shifts here from local issues to global issues, from issues that had immediate impact. If you drank caloric water, you felt it the next day or within a few hours, but we still don't know what climate change will do. And then from health threatening to life support threatening. 
Now, my argument is, is that we don't see this anymore, and particularly we don't see this in Asia, because all of these issues are occurring in one city at any, one, at any period of time. And what I'd like to show you then is, for example, these are all a little old numbers, and they probably have decreased, certainly, because of efforts in China, but the numbers are ginormous. These are access to adequate water supply and adequate sanitation, not improved. And here we have for Asia, we're talking about orders of magnitude of uh, 600 to 800 million people without sanitation and 500 to 700 million without fresh water supply. At the same time, we have transportation uh, CO2 emissions rising rapidly. So from 1990 to 2008, we see that uh, annual change is almost 4%. Again, obviously related to consumption issues. And on top of all this, as was mentioned, we have these massive populations largely living in, in urban areas on the coast that are vulnerable, if you will, to things like climate change. This is the percent of population and land area in low elevation coastal zones. This was a study that was published a few years ago. And if you look at Asia, you see the share of the region's population and land in these low elevation zones, 18%. So these, arguably, these people would be vulnerable if there were things like storm surges and other uh, floods, et cetera. Okay. Um, so in absence of these transitions, what you would argue is that from the, let's say, from the development community, you'd have the brown agenda and the gray agenda, which is pollution, and the green agenda all within sort of one location, all being experienced by multiple uh, 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 sets of populations within one one area. Okay, and finally, rather than this community without propinquity, um, which was uh, 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 predicted, what we're finding is that, I mean, I'm, my, my, my uh, advisor was Saskia Sasson, so, you know, she was always an advocate of how important cities are and demonstrated that very, very in importantly, and that these, the, the importance of cities continues to grow, not only economically, as was demonstrated, but socially as well as politically. They are now sort of the areas where we want political action to occur. And with that, I'll stop. Okay, um, for the last three years, I've been working with colleagues in China and a colleague in the research department at the World Bank on trying to understand uh, what's happening to CO2 emissions in China's urban um, infrastructure industries. And the message I want to give is that there's been enormous improvement uh, technologically that has saved in absolute terms an enormous amount of CO2 in these industries, but it's not near enough. It's not bending the CO2 curve. All right. How do you make this thing work? On the side. Yeah. Ah, well, got it. All right, simple. Um, urbanization, cities account for 74% of China's GDP, and by 2020, 2025, 93% of the increase in GDP is going to originate in cities. Cities generate, in China, an enormous increase in demand for infrastructure. We heard a little bit of this from Warren and Peter. I have my own little story here. Uh, Mackenzie is arguing that between 2005 and 2030, China will add 4.5 million buildings of at least 30 stories. Um, herb, and, the next thing I'm going to show you is that China's urbanization has had a huge impact on China's energy intensive industries that are the building blocks of urban infrastructure. And the industries that I focused on are cement, <coughs> iron and steel, aluminum, and pulp and paper. And finally, of course, we all know one can't deal with global chi climate change without dealing with China and I think you can't do it without dealing with this problem, the urban infrastructure problem. Um, 
right now, and, and actually for a long time now, 60% um, of CO2 emissions come from industry, and 60% of that is for industries. Cement, iron and steel, pulp and paper, and aluminum. Said another way, 36% of China's CO2 emissions come from these four industries. Um, urban infrastructure and the growth in these industries. What we've got here is, uh, that's the growth in the amount of cement from almost nothing in 1960. China pr is now currently producing 2 billion metric tons of cement. That's more than 60% of the world's total production of cement. It produces 45% of the world's iron and steel. It is the largest producer of aluminum and the largest producer of paper in the world. You see these growth curves are uh, just exponential. The little dots, I've been playing around with what drives the growth in these curves. I've tried a whole bunch of different variables for the economists in the room. I've done a little vector autoregression, a little uh, error correction models. I've even done a structural VAR. The variable that fits this best is the percentage of the population in China that's urban. Wow. <laughs> the percentage of the population that China is urban. You want to track what's happening to cement output, iron and steel output, aluminum and pulp, pulp and paper. All you need to know is the percentage of the population that's urban. It's all being driven by China's massive urbanization. So the next question you have to ask yourself, what options are there for reducing CO2 emissions from China's urban infrastructure industries? There are, it seems to me, three basic ones. You can slow the pace of urbanization. We know that ain't going to happen. <laughs> In fact, China's already planning for 250 million more, and McKenzie says it's really 350 million more. You can make urbanization more sustainable by changing urban design to reduce demand of the output of these energy intensive industries. And there's some of this going around. I mean, China has a couple of sustainable cities programs. There's one in Suzhou, there's another in Tianjin. It has a program where it annually rates, ranks, and publicly discloses the environmental performance of the 100 largest cities. So there is some of this, but it's not nearly enough. So what my, I and my colleagues have tried to do is focus on answering the question. What can you do to improve energy e efficiency and reduce the energy and CO2 intensities of urban infrastructure industries? And by the way, how much of this has already happened in China? How much, how much have we gained by doing this? If you're going to improve energy efficiency, you really only have about four options for doing so. One, you can raise the price of energy to its, at least its market value. And for most energy inputs now, China has slowly moved the price of energy close to market value. It's done a lot here. You can adopt, as China has done in 1980 to 2000, and then from 2000 to 2000 and 2005 and 2010, you can adopt quantitative time-bound energy intensity reduction goals. You can monitor and enforce against those goals. China has done this. The World Bank financed a whole bunch of energy conservation centers and energy service uh, saving um, suppliers, uh, and China has done that. The third thing you can do is promote high-speed technological catch-up in these energy intensive industries. And as I will show you in a moment, there are enormous opportunities for doing that in China. And fortunately, at least in my view, China is playing a high-speed technological catch-up game in these industries and in lots of others. And finally, you can promote dramatic shifts in new technologies. Wind, solar, um, and I'll mention a few others at the end. I'm going to focus almost everything I say on the point number three there the promotion of high-speed technological catch-up. And I do that for three reasons. One, there's a big assumption in the developed world that if the developing world just got access to the state-of-the-art technologies, 
we can slow the rate of growth or maybe even bend down the CO2 curve. We can yield very big declines in CO2 intensities. Second, there is good evidence from China, some of it by Hu and Jefferson at, at Brandeis, which shows that reaping the benefits of FDI linked to is almost determined by enterprise level investments in technological learning. Said another way, if you want to get firm, you want to be technological spillover effects as associated with FDI, the firms that it's spilling over to have to make major investments in technological learning. If they don't, you don't get much spillover. Finally, in a, an econometric study that we did as a part of this, we demonstrated that reducing energy intensity at the enterprise level in China is dependent on enterprise investments in technological learning. So those are reasons we focus on tech learning. Um, then I, I like this little example. That's the CO2 intensity of uh, cement in China and Indonesia. And this is a real nice technical learning and, uh, 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 a piece. The cement industry in Indonesia now is dominated by OECD cement multinationals. They bought out the domestic firms at fire sale prices as a consequence of the 1997 uh, uh, crisis in Indonesia. Notice that CO2 intensity in cement is rising in Indonesia and falling in China. And it's now higher in Indonesia than it, uh, than it is in China. And what's important about that is it looks like, for some reason, the OECD multina cement multinationals in China are not particularly interested in saving energy. Why not? The energy price is wrong. They're big subsidies. So if you send the wrong signal, even the OECD multinationals aren't going to save energy. In China, you get something different. Um, this is a picture of cement production in China. It's important for really two reasons. This piece here, from the Great Leap Forward and administrative and market decentralization, this is a period from 1958, 19, yeah, 1958 to 1992, where the Chinese government promoted small-scale industry in capital-intensive industries. So in cement, in iron and steel, in aluminum, in pulp and paper, China had, I'll show you in a minute, until recently, very small scale energy inefficient antiquated factories in every one of these industries. So for example, in cement, here is the growth of something called vertical shaft kilns. They may produce anywhere from a Oh, maybe a thousand tons of cement a year, maybe a couple of thousand tons of cement a year, maybe 50 tons a day in a small, uh, 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 essentially an 18th century vertical shaft kiln. Those things exploded with market liberalization in China. Their share went from 20% to almost 90%. And only recently has that turned around. What does that look like in fact? That's how cement was made in China in the late 70s. That's a pit kiln. That's a hole in the ground with bricks. Um, some of these still exist. I have a case study of a firm that started this way and ended up on the technological frontier. Started out as a commune enterprise, ended up, then became a town and village enterprise, and now is a corporatized uh, operating with a uh, state-of-the-art stuff. Here is what dominated cement production in China from about 1978 to about 1992. Vertical and me mechanical shaft kilns. These things are everywhere in China. They're dirty as all get out. They're small. They're polluting as all hell. Here's a guy with a shovel at the top up here, shoveling stuff, coal and uh, limestone into a vertical shaft kiln. Very energy intensive, very polluting. China set about to eliminate these things, and it largely has. Now, some of them have become modern vertical shaft kilns. And some of those modern vertical shaft kilns are actually about as energy efficient as big rotary kilns. Finally, this is what the cement industry looks like in China today. 
not only is this what the cement industry looks like in China today, almost all of these kilns, almost all of the, the whole damn factory is built by the Chinese. The Chinese decided in the late 80s that they had two choices around cement. They knew they had to shift to modern rotary kilns. They said they could do two things. We could either invite the OECD engineering firms and they could build this stuff for us, but then they're going to get all the gravy. Or what we can do is we can develop our own capacity to design, manufacture, install, commission, and repair state-of-the-art kilns. And there are half a dozen engineering firms in China now that have essentially captured the Chinese market in this stuff. They're also now capturing the world market in this stuff. They're big exporters of state-of-the-art rotary kilns, and they're building state-of-the-art rotary kilns for the OED cement multinationals in China, in Europe, in, in uh, South Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America. That's tech, that, ladies and germs, is technological change. <laughs> How did this technological change happen? China adopted in the middle 90s something called grasp the large, let go the small. It did this in cement, iron and steel, aluminum, pulp and, pe pulp and paper, basically you name the industry. Grasp the large, let go the small was we're going to let the town and village enterprises die. And in fact, we're going to forcibly close them. And we're going to force the existing enterprises to merge. And we're going to try to create large enterprises that can compete with OECD multinationals. And you named the business. And in cement, they created a state-of-the-art uh, engineering, a set of engineering firms to do this. They also did a lot to reduce energy intensity, I've mentioned before. And finally, they established a goal to become an innovation economy. And Chinese have done something that I just haven't seen in the rest of the, uh, rest of the developing world. Almost everywhere in the developing world, you have public sector S&T uh, agencies or research institutes. Most of them are moribund. Most of them are terrible. Most of them have no link to the private sector. That was a little less true in China, but China decided that it was going to force these folks to become competitive and market-oriented. And it essentially said to the folks in these enterprises, you have two choices. You adapt or you die. And you die by, we're going to cut your budget. And a bunch of these have become market-oriented S&T agencies. All right. So now we get to the, the, the bottom line here. What has China done to save energy and CO2 in its energy-intensive industries? Um, with colleagues in each one of these industries, we try to develop back-of-the-envelope estimates of how much energy and CO2 was saved by interventions in each of these industries. So for example, in cement, what we've got is an increase in the amount of cement that is blended in China. China is now the world's leader in the production of blended cement. You take fly ash or you take blast furnace slag, you grind it up, and then you mix it with clinker after it comes out of the kiln. Blended cement is an enormous way to save energy and CO2 for two reasons. One, when you burn uh, limestone in a, in, in a kiln, it calcifies and emits CO2, and it takes a lot of energy to do that. By shifting from almost nothing in blended cement to 40% of blended cement, 40% of 2 billion metric tons of cement is an enormous amount of cement. By 2010, China saved almost 600 me million metric tons of CO2 if they hadn't shifted this radically to blended cement. They also saved by kiln efficiency improvements and by shifting from VSKs, vertical shaft kilns, to rotary kilns. Um, so they saved, in total, nine, almost a billion metric tons of CO2. How about aluminum production? China's aluminum production like it, I, I wish I brought the pictures along. It's uh, aluminum production like it was cement production in tiny antiquated uh, facilities for making aluminum. The big savings here of almost 200 million metric tons of CO2 came from 
eliminating the Soder Soderberg process for making alumina and closing uh, very small aluminum smelting plants uh, that use an antiquated technology and shift to uh, uh, more modern and, and large-scale plants. How about in steel? This is where the biggest change is. By 2008, my estimate, our estimate is, is that China saved 2.2 billion metric tons of CO2 in iron and steel production. And they did it the same way they did it in cement and um, aluminum. They closed small plants. They phased out inefficient uh, uh, iron making and coke making plants. The biggest change here, more than a billion metric tons of CO2 came from a reduction in the iron to steel ratio associated with a shift to electric arc furnaces. You talk to folks in the Chinese steel industry and they say 10 years, maybe 15 years from now, there'll be no coke making in China, there will be no blast furnaces in China because we're going to have so many automobiles and so much metal that we're going to be able to generate enough scrap to go to electric arc furnaces. Next one. Same thing in pulp and paper. Technological change. Close small industries. About half of that is from closing very tiny uh, factories. The other half is from material substitution. China is now the biggest importer and used uh, user of waste paper in the world. And you no longer have to make pulp out of raw material. And they've saved to, uh, roughly 225 million metric tons of CO2 by that technological shift. Uh, here's what's happened to the CO2 intensities in each of these industries. Uh, fallen somewhere between 40 and 60% in, uh, in about 20 years. Uh, and here's how much CO2 has been saved for the globe by China doing this. CO2 emissions in the world in 2008 were 9% lower than they would have been if China hadn't gone into high-speed technological catch-up. So keys to China's success. Outward looking trade and investment policies expose enterprises to competition and new technologies. Liberalization of input prices for energy to encourage energy conservation. Adopt aggressive quantitative and time bound goals for reducing energy intensity. And my claim, or our claim, is all of this has been tethered to a high speed industrial technological catch up strategy. Here's the bad news getting it right via, via technological ca catch up is nowhere near enough. The scale effects swamp. The tech, what, what economists call the environmental technique effects. CO2 emissions from these four industries rose more than five times between 1985 and 2009. They would have risen a lot more without the technical change, but it ain't near enough. Second, I think it's probably unreasonable to assume that the demand for output of the energy intensive industries is going to peak anytime soon in China. China. And I say that for three reasons. One, China's new industrial development strategy or its new development strategy is, go, it is a move away from investment and exports to domestic consumption. That's what its urbanization strategy is all about. That's going to increase domestic demand for living space, for automobiles, for appliances. So I don't think this stuff's going to peak anytime soon. And I don't think you can shut that off or turn it back. Secondly, when it comes to cement, the life of Chinese cement is about half of the life of cement in the OECD. So this stuff's going to rot. That's going to have to be replaced. <laughs> Third, living space in China, residential living space, is growing quite, ra quite rapidly. So with affluence, we all want more living space. So the combination of a shift in development strategy based on increasing consumption, the fact that the uh, cement doesn't last very long, and the, the last suggests I don't think you can expect this to peak anytime soon. What does that mean for climate change? What does that mean for us? I think it puts the burden on new technologies. 
And I'll just mention one. There is one, and I first became aware of it from my colleagues in China in, in this premier environmental engineering firm for cement, is to take CO2 and sequester it with some kind of salt water, and actually you can make bricks out of it. And there's a corporation in California called Calera, and an environmental economist, I think at Berkeley, who has been, been doing some work on this to suggest that this is actually economically viable. Um, is it? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't really know. But with that, I'll stop. Are you your PowerPoint also? Yeah. I Hi. Uh, I'll be talking not about industries but about cities and, and giving you sort of an overall presentation about uh, sustainability issues in, uh, in Asia. Uh, I'll speak first briefly about urbanization uh, trends. I mean, uh, some of the stuff that uh, Warren talked about. Uh, I'll also talk about briefly about what urbanization is about, the benefits and the costs of urbanization, and then I'll try to give you a few ideas about what I mean by sustainability, covering some issues of urban planning, energy efficiency, uh, wastewater, and so forth. And then if I have some time, I'll talk about uh, the, the financing dimension of, uh, of wh what I have been talking about. Uh, very quickly, since Warren uh, covered some of that ground, let me give you an idea of the, what, what urbanization has been like in the past uh, 40 years. I mean, here is a chart. I mean, all of this is the same uh, UN population data that uh, Peter uh, used. Uh, you see the rate of growth of, uh, er, of cities in, around the world. You see also that by far the fastest rate of growth has been in, uh, in Asian cities, uh, in particular about East, in East Asia, less so in, uh, in South Asia, uh, and uh, surprisingly in, uh, in some African country. Uh, where you had, in some cases, actually uh, urbanization without much growth. Um, as also was mentioned before, the number of mega cities, I mean, cities larger than uh, 2 million, has hugely increased in the past 40 years, not only in terms of, of sheer numbers. In 1970, only two cities were, were mega cities. Uh, I believe it was Tokyo and Mexico. Uh, now we have uh, something like 20, 25 of them, and, uh, and they're growing. And in terms of population, you see the, the amount of population uh, inhabiting the cities uh, grows uh, by leaps and bounds. Uh, most cities now around the world, and many of them are in uh, developing countries, are much larger in terms of population than many countries. Uh, at the top of the chart, you have Sweden, uh, Belgium in, in yellow, uh, and then you see some, uh, some of the size of cities. So that gives you a sense of the dimension of the problem in terms of, of population. The largest city, as we know, is, uh, is Tokyo, but uh, Delhi, uh, Shanghai, and many other cities are much larger than very large countries like, like Canada or the Ukraine. Uh, in let, let me skip this. I mean, this is just a breakdown. Well, actually, it's a breakdown, and you also see that in terms of distribution, you know, top cities, uh, next uh, sort of medium size, uh, and, and other cities, you see that things look very different 
in China and in India than they look uh, in uh, the United States or, or Western, uh, Western Europe. Now, in, uh, in Asia, as we know, uh, there, there have been several rounds of urbanization. It started, of course, with Japan, and this links up with the presentation of Michael. Uh, urbanization was, of course, driven by efforts to industrialize and modernize. Uh, when uh, Japan in the Meiji era uh, started uh, you know, specializing in labor-intensive and low-tech uh, industries, uh, it was followed uh, after the war by the, 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 the tiger con you know, countries, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and, and the like. Uh, soon after, by, by you know, lesser uh, tigers, so to speak, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, which have been growing very fast uh, in, the, in the 80s, essentially. And then you have the cases, uh, you know, in many ways, a unique of, of China, about which uh, Michael spoke, and India, which uh, has a, a fairly unique uh, growth process. I mean, or sit, urban uh, growth process, which is actually very different from China, since, as you know, in China, uh, you know, by, by design, the growth took place largely on the coast and then moved uh, inland. Uh, now, what are the benefits and, and costs of urbanization? I mean, we know that, you know, the benefits, uh, and this was already mentioned by Marshall in his principle of economics at the beginning of the, the 20th century is what is known as agglomeration effects. Uh, you have, uh, so in other words, you, you know, you, you're, a, by, by having larger cities, you can save on, on inputs from the cities, including, by the way, infrastructure. So in other words, having uh, one city of 8 million people uh, saves you on an, on a number of economic inputs rather than having two cities of four billion uh, four uh, million people. Um, so there are large benefits, and most of these benefits are, uh, you know, the agglomeration of, of of industries, but also of talent. Of, but of course there are huge uh, huge costs. Uh, what are these costs? Well, you know, as you know, most of you know from uh, from your readings, uh, you know, whether from reading uh, Oliver Twist or other Dickens novels, from reading uh, this wonderful book by Jacob Rees that talks about the the tenements of New York at the beginning of the 20th century, or this amazing book actually, which is on a, a slum of Mumbai, written by Catherine Boo uh, recently. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, London in 1840, New York in the 19, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, Bombay today. As we know, uh, you know, these populations moved actually to cities attracted by, by the perception that, um, you know, things were better in cities, that they would find the jobs and that, uh, and that the, 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 their situation or the situation of their children would be better. Uh, is that true? Well, in some cases it is, in some cases it's not. What are the costs of urbanization? As we know, one of the main one is uh, congestion, uh, you know, the, the density of traffic to the point of choking the, the city. Uh, another cost is, you know, the enormous uh, environmental challenges, uh, waste, for example, collecting waste. I mean, this is uh, Greece, but, um, you know, it's true in Cairo. It's true in many, many other cities. Um, poor housing and slums in, uh, in, many, in many cities, uh, for example, this, for example, is, uh, is in India. Uh, air pollution, which has been mentioned uh, in uh, in China, for example, you know, one of the major uh, downside of urbanization has been uh, pollution uh, and uh, crime, which is a huge issue in uh, in Latin America. 
So therefore, the need to focus on, uh, on more sustainable and more livable cities. Now, sustainable means, means many, many things to, I mean, different things to different people. Uh, the first time that the, the, the world community focused on sustainability has been probably at the Rio conference. Uh, before that, you had what is known as the Brundtland Commission, which came out uh, with a, a definition which I actually like a lot. Uh, you know, it's a simple definition looking at uh, intergenerational issue. It's, it says that sustainability means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of our children to meet their own needs. And as you see from the diagram, it focuses on economic issues, on social issues, uh, and on environmental issues, all, all of those issues I've, uh, I've mentioned before. Now, strangely enough, there is still a large part of the population that uh, considers these issues of sustainability uh, dangerous. Uh, in the U.S., for example, uh, Glenn Beck and uh, you know and some uh, political groups in the U.S. considered that Agenda 21, which was essentially the Rio Conference uh, agenda for the 21st century, is is tantamount to to communism and uh, and a takeover by by communists. Uh, but now more and more, actually, the the, the policy makers and uh, and, and um, you know, the academic and policy community are focusing more seriously on, uh, on sustainability. Now, there, there are many, many um, uh, indicators that you can find, uh, indicators of, of what sustainability means. I mean, how, how do you actually measure it? Uh, there, for example, Portney, uh, was one of the first to look at ecological dimensions of sustainability. The World Bank came out with its own uh, indicators. Uh, I like the, the McKinsey indicators, which were actually uh, developed by the McKinsey team working in China uh, and looking at, at various cities in China. As you see, I mean, they focus on, and they have actually very simple indicators, um, simple uh, measurable indicators. They focus one on, on basic needs, things like uh, uh, water supply, but also health and ba basic health and education services. Uh, they focus on resource efficiency, some of the stuff that uh, Michael talked about, on environmental issues like air pollution, uh, on, um, on urban planning, and, and the like. I mean, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I mean, I, it's interesting to use this and, and, you know, use some cities as benchmark to see how comparatively cities are, are doing. Now, what are, what, what are livable cities? The first one, this has been mentioned uh, by my predecessors before, I think, f first and foremost, uh, livable cities in the future will be more energy efficient uh, cities. Uh, in terms of the urban form, so the, the planning of the city, uh, one finds that, uh, you know, the built up area of the city, uh, of, of uh, sustainable cities are very compact. Street networks are dense. Uh, dense uh, buildings, uh, you know, the density of buildings in the city is, is high. Uh, so are jobs, social infrastructure. Uh, public transit uh, is also matched with urban density. Uh, urban blocks are small, uh, allow people to live uh, in the street, in uh, you know, internal gardens, courtyard, uh, walk around the cities uh, and the like. And ba basically, you know, it's cities where the urban fabric optimizes the, the bioclimatic po potential of the, of the cities. Uh, why, um, why do I say that? Well, look at uh, the difference. I mean, this is a famous paper comparing Atlanta with uh, Barcelona. Uh, 
basically both cities have roughly the same uh, population, but Atlanta is much more, uh, you know, uh, is uh, the urban sprawl of uh, Atlanta is much larger, whereas Barcelona, uh, much smaller and much more compact. Uh, Atlanta is more than 4,000 square kilometers of uh, urban area, Barcelona 162, uh, and you see the, 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 uh, the density, how different the, the density is. Uh, what, what is this, wh what is sprawl and what are changes in the urban form influenced by? But there are, I think, three key factors that, that are determinant. One, of course, is the transportation technology. So the, the average distance that you can travel in one hour. Uh, if you improve uh, traffic speed in a city, this will encourage urban sprawl and leads lead to to cities um, you know spreading around the uh, the area uh, land uh, values uh, can also be a much uh, contributing factor the improvement of course of transportation technology and of infrastructure uh, can make rural land uh, much more accessible and therefore facilitates the the conversion of urban of rural land into into cities which means that if you don't have very strong land value controls uh, the market forces will basically lead very quickly to to sprawl uh, and then finally uh, policies themselves uh, can be a huge factor uh, you know if you have proactive uh, policies i mean that that can counter uh, or accompany some uh, some the the market forces themselves. Uh, in other words, you know, environmental cities. I mean, f I will I will show you in an instant how. But basically, environmentally sustainable cities are s cities that are you know emit less carbon dioxide per inhabitant. Uh, and are socially and and economically uh, sustainable now of course w this doesn't mean that you sh you should uh, you know do away with existing cities and build new one i mean uh, very few countries can afford to do that uh, china being one of them but so most of the time you have to do retrofitting and i will give you an exam a, a few examples of you know, simple technologies, easy fixes that allow retrofitting and lead to much more reduced uh, uh, energy efficiency. Uh, global, let, let me move on. I mean, we, we have spoken about that already. Uh, as you know, uh, f amongst others from uh, Warren's presentation, you know, global warming has increased to the point where now we have reached the 400 parts per million uh, level. Uh, so both energy efficiency uh, in buildings, in the urban form, and in transportation system is, is necessary. How can you, uh, or, or what are the elements of, of uh, energy savings? Well, as you see from this chart, which I've drawn from a recent uh, World Bank uh, report, uh, in terms of residential uh, and, and commercial buildings, uh, the, there are three opportunities to, to achieve energy efficiency. One is in new buildings, uh, maximize, minimizing their active energy use. The second one, as I just mentioned, is in retrofitting uh, buildings. Uh, and then in uh, the case of office equipment and appliances, uh, any, everything from light bulbs to, um, you know, to, to, to um, heating in buildings, uh, energy uh, savings. Uh, transportation is also a major area, uh, first by promoting 
public transport, walking, bicycling, and the like. Uh, second, by you know, fuel efficiency gains from passenger uh, vehicles. For example, switching to CNG, uh, compressed natural gas, as uh, the city of New Delhi has done, uh, has greatly reduced uh, emission. Uh, and uh, same with, uh, with freight uh, transport. And then finally, in municipal transport, one key issue is water and wastewater and sanitation, uh, as well, of course, as uh, public lighting. Uh, when it comes to water conservation, uh, there are several ways that uh, improvements can be made in water conservation. First, of course, by introducing incentive to use the the use of water, I mean, simply price incentive or other economic incentives, uh, or also by uh, controlling leaks, for example, or, or simply mismanagement in, uh, in water system as uh, the city of Tokyo, which actually is the, 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 the water company of Tokyo is the, the largest water s company in the world. Uh, they have introduced a, a very strict system of water conservation and, uh, and, and checking on, uh, on leaks. Let me move on since I don't have much more time. Uh, I mentioned, you know, retrofitting and easy fixes. So let me finish with a few examples of technologies that you know, at least most of them you know, uh, that can make a huge difference in terms of sustainability. You know, parking, smart parking uh, being one of them. Uh, underground transportation, of course, like, and this being the, the metro of DC is another one. Uh, in terms of power, uh, in some cities like, uh, like Orkney in, in Scotland have introduced wave power. Uh, you know, turning on turbines below the sea to create electricity. Uh, in Berlin, they use photovoltaic sheets uh, to generate electricity. Uh, in uh, New York City also uses underwater turbines. Uh, solar power is actually now uh, very widespread around the world. Um, there are new technologies under development like uh, carbon sequestering concrete, um, water pricing, and in particular storm water pricing is uh, uh, has been uh, the the object of new technologies. For example, in the city of Philadelphia, uh, you all know about LEED uh, buildings. I mean, so standards which. Um, uh, are fairly strict in terms of energy uh, and, uh, and emissions that, that you see uh, all over this region, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I will uh, now stop here, uh, but if, we, okay. if you want to discuss some maybe financing issues during the discussion, we can, uh, we can do that. Thank you. Peter, you're going to reflect now. Uh, yeah. I'll reflect from my seat. <laughs> uh, just to introduce a personal note, uh, just last, this past Thursday, uh, there was a, a ceremony uh, in honor of the 60th anniversary of the signing of the armistice in Korea. Uh, that was of interest to me because I was there at the time and was happy about that armistice being signed. But I spent uh, Christmas of 1952 in Seoul, and at that time I was on my way to uh, Japan and R&R, &R, and at that time the city was deserted. Seoul had been evacuated because the North Korean army and the South Korean armies had gone back and forth through the city, a desperately poor country to begin with and ravaged by war. Uh, fast forward about 25 years to about 1975, 
when, as an aid official, I went to Seoul. And my mission there was to help AID establish a regional housing and urban development office for Asia. I went to three cities. I went to Seoul, Manila, and Bangkok. And we did put it in Seoul at that time. When I arrived in Seoul 25 years later, it was a modern city with skyscrapers and a metro. It was, it was it just, I can't describe adequately the impact that that had on me, the difference between Seoul in 1952 and Seoul in 1978. So we, we can see that this urbanization process, the thing that we're talking about, is really going on, has really gone on, and it's going to continue to go on. And on the panel that we have here today, we have an enormous amount of expertise and I think we should take advantage of the discussion period to pursue further with them what the key outstanding issues are. Uh, there is no question that uh, the urbanization is happening, and there's no question that global climate change is happening. Now, I currently represent the International Housing Coalition, and that's an advocacy organization. We're trying to advocate to get the people who make decisions to make decisions that would favor the group we advocate for, and the group we now advocate for are the slum dwellers in the developing world. And so I would say to you, as you uh, ask questions and make comments from the audience, take a look at these issues and these problems and what did the react what the response has been so far and what we anticipate the response will be what is it that you members of the development community of the aid agencies the international development banks the civil society organizations most important of all of these institutions are the decision makers in the developing countries themselves what is it that we can do? What is it that we should be doing that would really come to grips with the issue? So. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so we're going to open it up now for questions, comments. Uh, and again, there will be a couple of people with microphones. Uh, please use those because we are uh, webcasting. And, uh, and again, if you don't mind, uh, give your name and affiliation before you ask a question or give a comment. And if you want to direct your question uh, or comment to one of the panelists, please feel free to do that as well. So the floor is open. This ma'am and the lady in the middle here. And then number two over there. Okay. Patricia Fagan, Georgetown University. I actually have a question for Warren Evans, but it certainly relates to the last question, the last point that uh, Peter just made. When you gave your introduction, you said, in, in speaking in general, that consumption and expenditures and production in urban areas far was far superior than that of rural areas, which of course is true. But my question is, if, and you also said that the majority of people coming into urban areas are poor people from rural areas. This being the case, is the, if you one were to disaggregate the urban population and look just at the poorest segments, would the difference between rural and urban spending be significantly great? And if, as I suspect, in Asian cities as in African cities, it takes a very long time, if at all, before the urban poor move ahead, um, what, what would you, what are, what are your prognosis, what are your prog uh, what's your prognosis on the gradual improvement of living standards among the fast-growing urban poor? Thank you. Okay. We'll take a, a few here. Uh, in the middle on this side, please. There's right to your right. Um, hi, my name is Meg. I'm an economist at the World Bank. So I have two questions. One is directed at Michael Rock and the other one at Jean-Jacques. Um, Michael, your presentation on China and technologies and industries and firms, it was terribly interesting. Uh, but whilst you were speaking, I couldn't help wondering to what extent, and actually I learned a lot from your presentation. I was just wondering to what extent um, the China model is actually uh, replicable in other Asian countries, for example, in South Asia or for matter, even in African countries, where the nature of urbanization is in fact very different. There's um, poverty at unprecedented scales, and the kind of firms that you're talking about in most of 
uh, Asian and African countries, informality is the new norm, which means the firms are not massive um, state-owned enterprises or enterprises that can actually imbibe any of this technology. I mean, just as an example, uh, state-owned enterprises in China function very differently from state-owned enterprises anywhere in the rest of Asia or in Africa. They're actually mammoths as opposed to perhaps faster-moving enterprises in China. So I was wondering how much of that, to what extent is technology really going to help uh, urbanization patterns elsewhere in Asia? Um, and Jean-Jacques, you touched upon the design of urban form when you were starting off. And uh, I, I know from personal experience that once the design of the urban form is already laid out, it's actually very difficult to change it. Once settlements have already been made, it's difficult to redesign cities, at least in democratic countries. It's very difficult to redesign cities. And I was wondering if you had any examples or, or any ways in which you think it would be possible to do that within, say, a century or half a century. And if um, this leads on to your your topic, which you didn't cover about financing. That would also be very useful. Thanks. Okay. We'll take one more, and then we'll do another round. So. Thanks. I want to piggyback on that question. Andrew Simmons, I'm an urban development consultant and formerly with Arup, um, living in Shanghai as an urban designer. Um, and later, actually, I'm still affili affiliated with Blue Path Consulting, um, which, by the way, um, has an office in Beijing. and is also the first office tenant of the Sino-Singapore Tianjin EcoCity, so I know that project well. And it's connected so to the last question for, for Jean-Jacques to ask about how projects are finance and investment driven. Um, and and I wanted to, if we say that um, ghost towns are an indicator um, that um, a lot of times you, uh, ur urban development projects are built and may have sustainability features and they may be commercially successful because they're bought and sold but they're unoccupied, and I, this is what's um, foreseeable, in fact, with, for example, the Tianjin project, unfortunately, and this is unfortunately a trend that's tied to speculative development, um, and so I wonder, wondered what your thoughts uh, on that are, and then how, it, um, given that projects might be more finance-driven than, um, than, than a lot of the journalist, uh, journalistic literature and other literature um, gives, gives credit to, what, what are some, um, what, what should be done about that, I guess, to actually make valid change? Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, the first question was directed to me, so I will respond. I, I don't have numbers, I, but I'm, I think it's uh, reasonable to assume that, that the urban poor uh, consumption levels are, are fairly similar to the rural poor. Sometimes might be, uh, uh, it, it depends on where you are and what, what the climate is, uh, but the, the bulk of the consumption is by the, the, uh, the industry, by the wealthy, uh, and increasingly by the emerging middle class. I think that the, the problem that's actually going to be very interesting, uh, a, a huge challenge and interesting to see how cities take this on is uh, in Asia, most of the urban poor live in low-lying areas in, in a lot of the cities. And those low-lying areas are the places that get flooded. And they used to get flooded periodically, and it was a mess because all the stuff got washed up out of the uh, pit latrines and around, you know, it, it was a true mess. But it's, that's now happening much more frequently. And if you look at Jakarta and a few other cities uh, like that, what you're seeing is that those areas are just simply not going to be inhabitable in the, in the future. It's not affordable to have people being washed out of slums uh, annually. And so cities are actually having to think now about what do we do uh, for those people? Where are they going to live? And in, in some places they're already moving. But uh, this is going to be a, an increasingly huge problem with the urban growth, with the urban growth of the urban poor, and with climate impacts, increased flooding in particular, uh, and in coastal areas, storm surges that, that hit those, those communities first and worst. So uh, the Again, the price tag goes up. Uh, nobody's come up with very reasonable estimates, in my view, of, of what it's going to cost to to take care of this problem. And and it's something we are, at least in the World Bank, we've, we're struggling with trying to generate some some ideas and and some scale of uh, some estimate of the scale of impact of impact and investment required to deal with the impact. So. Uh, the, then we'll go to, uh, I think, to Mike. Um, China is applicable only in one way. 
we know that long-run growth is driven by technolo technology change. So even the poorest countries, if they want to grow in the long run, have to play technological catch-up. Unfortunately, in my view, there are maybe only 10 countries in the world that have organized themselves for technological ca catch-up. And I think all of them, except for Brazil, are in East in Asia. East Asia. <laughs> they're, they're in East Asia. And they learn from the Japanese experience. My own view is that the Chinese Communist Party is a, it's like the LDP, it's a capitalist party that, that is ushering in a high-speed tech revolution that's changing China in such a way so rapidly. But the rest of the world has to learn how to do this. Uh, the Ghanaians have to learn how to do this. About four years ago, I was sent by Unida, uh, UNIDO to, uh, to Ghana to look at their ready-made garment industry. And they were just in the early stages of it. There's a port in Tema that was supposed to have, with flatted factory space, and the, the flatted factory space was empty. The T-shirts the, the that were being produced were just, they, they couldn't be sold in the developed world. And I came away from the experience thinking the Ghanaians don't know what the world is like. They don't know what's hit them yet. Now, at some point, my view is they will catch up. And then they're going to have to learn to play the high-speed technological catch-up game. How countries do it is different from country to country. Uh, but they got to do it. And if they're going to grow and they're going to urbanize, they're going to need iron and steel and cement, if not aluminum. And they're either going to buy it from the rest of the world, with the rest of the world's CO2 emissions, or they're going to learn how to make it the way the rest of the world does and generate their own CO2 emissions. And if they don't do it in a high-speed technological catch-up way, we're all going to be worse off. Okay. Jean-Jacques? Yeah. Uh, you know, before I answer the comments, I, I want to comment on Michael. I, I also thought, like, like Mega, that... Uh, his presentation was outstanding. But you know, you, you have to realize that what he was talking about is actually savings from having used in the past outdated technology. I mean, so in many cases, actually, China is not on the technology frontier. In some cases, some very few cases it is. But uh, so as you correctly mentioned, I mean, we're, we're far from uh, you know, from, from being in the process of, of substantial reductions. It's reductions with respect to what it would have been had they continued to use those, those awful technologies. So now to, to get to the, the questions, uh, first question, uh, of course, yes, you cannot, um, you know, most of the, the infrastructure in cities and the, 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 the city itself uh, exists. And uh, uh, we know that you know, infrastructure, depending on the type of infrastructure, is there to stay for somewhere between 20, 30 years to 200 years when it comes to, to dams and things like that. I mean, they're, so, so uh, we cannot uh, bulldoze them or raise them. Um, and we have to work around it. But I think what is often, I mean, I'm not, in a way, I'm sort of eschewing a, a little bit the, the answer. But, you know, I think people tend to forget that when it comes to sustainability, you know, one key element uh, in, uh, of, the, of the answer is policies. And I think there's still a range of policies that we still have not uh, you know, used uh, efficiently or correctly, the main one being pricing. You know, very frankly, if energy was priced at its correct value, and not only market value, but actually internalizing many of the negative externalities, uh, you would see a very different world. Uh, that's, in effect, what you see when you compare superficially Europe with the United States. Europe simply because since they don't have energy, I mean, they have to use other things, which essentially are policies, not necessarily smart policies, but more, you know, policies that, uh, you know, give more incentives to, to technology, to, to conservation of, of energy. And then, um, you know, institutions also can be a, you know, can be, can be a, you know, make a huge contribution you know anything from uh, getting used to congestion pricing in london to 
to other ways, uh, to, to walking uh, in cities, for example, or, or, or biking. I mean, these, these are things that will change little by little. Uh, and of course, when it comes to new uh, infrastructure, uh, adopting infrastructure that are flexible enough to allow changes you know, in, uh, during the span of life of the, of the infrastructure. Now, concerning the the comment of the of the gentleman about uh, China, uh, unoccupied buildings and so forth, yeah, I mean you're right. I mean there is there seems to be uh, a lot of overcapacity in uh, in China. Uh, they're building probably too much uh, infrastructure too fast. But you know, as as we have heard from uh, from Peter's uh, presentation, for example. Uh, you, you see that actually the, the speed of change is such, I mean, China being still one of the fastest growing countries uh, in the world, even if its rate of growth has dropped from you know, 9.5 to, to 7%, it's still a highly uh, you know, accelerated growth. Uh, I think that it's, uh, you know, it's, this over, overcapacity will... You know, you will find in a few years that actually it's it's not overcapacity. It's just a, a smart way of marrying market forces and uh, and proactive policies, uh, communist party style. I mean, it's you know this is the uniqueness about about China. I mean, they're probably the best capitalist you can imagine, while being a non-democratic, uh, communist party-driven country. Uh, and I don't think, by the way, that. Uh, these projects are finance-driven, as you, you mentioned. I mean, the, it's not banks who are trying to make money out of it. In fact, uh, on the contrary, I think Chinese banks are the servants of you know, whoever their, their, their master is, and uh, the, the financing uh, follows uh, the builders uh, proceed. Okay. Do either of the Peters want to reflect on those first three questions? Um, sure, I, but I'm interested in uh, the question about um, the polarization of incomes in urban versus rural. Um, I'd like to ask, what, what was the question, what, what were you trying to get at there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it seems to be in, I don't know Asia as well as Africa and Latin America, right. but it seems that the migration of poor people from rural areas to urban areas does not result in a significant improvement in standard of living. Ah. Many, many times the exodus is due to be push factors as much as pull factors okay. anyways. Okay. But at some point, as Warren said, that slum, and Peter too, the slum dweller population is part of the urban fabric. And as a city grows, the slums cannot continue to, continue to grow as they presently are without serious consequences in my mind right. in terms of security and, and environment and all the other factors we've discussed. But I, I mean, I guess I would, um, my comment or set of questions with that would um, be my understanding is is that those people even in slum dwellings um, have a better health as identified by child weight and height than those in poor rural areas they have better education as identified by number of uh, girls going to a primary school and they have uh, lower pop lower family sizes so they're bringing down population so I mean, I'm, I, I do see benefits in that case. Maybe, and, and arguably, this is probably related to consumption. You know, I, I don't have the numbers in terms of the actual consumption uh, expenditures from the urban poor in these areas, but it's just been my impression that that's the way it is, particularly in Asia. Um, and I, 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 so I was wondering if, if you didn't see that or you didn't, uh, weren't aware of the, 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 that information. I, I agree with that. Okay. Oh, th th there's no doubt that we live in an increasingly polarized world. And because most of us are being in cities, we're seeing the polarization in cities as opposed to sort of across a more larger geographic area. So, I mean, that was just one, one question I thought very, very interesting. But it had incredible implications. I think cities are um, 
very, very important and a very positive way to organize society. Peter? Yeah, uh, on, the, on the same subject, I think there's a pretty good consensus that the people who do move from rural areas to urban areas have a better life, have a better way of life. Their families, their children have a better way of life. It's still pretty terrible, but it's better than what they had and that, that it is in general a rational decision, the people who make the decision to move from rural areas to urban areas. Uh, I guess that's... Okay. I, I just, I, I think that's probably uh, right, but I, I think that in the next 20 years, we're gonna see uh, a, just the same as urbanization. Uh, the, the problem of the urban poor is going to be a problem that we've never dealt with mm, at yeah. scale. With and, climate change. And with, you know, in places like Ho Chi Minh City that is still living on an infrastructure that's, that's designed for a city a fraction of the population that it's got, if they end up with a million migrants because, from, coming from Mekong because of, of uh, climate impacts, which is the projection, that's a city that's gonna have uh, an unbelievable challenge in, in dealing with that kind of in migration. So I think it's a scale that, that we're looking at a scale uh, of, of a problem that has never been faced before. Okay, so that generated some questions. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, hello, yeah, my name is Ed Bear. I'm with the Sustainable World Initiative, and we study the relationship between human development and natural resources, need, uh, needs for natural resources, on a planetary scale. So I'd like to question for a minute the technological catch-up uh, development program you know, or agenda vision. Uh, and I'd cite Korea, for instance, as, hey, that's a success story. They've had a great economy, but they use 640% of their own natural resources to support that economy. They're taking them from the rest of the world. Likewise, China, 245% of utilization of natural, primary natural resources in the planet compared to what they have within their own country. So let's extend that philosophy to every country doing technological catch-up. I'm sorry, where is the second and third and fourth planet necessary to carry that out? <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, uh, David Pinder. I'm a uh, <laughs> former USAID officer, now uh, working as a consultant to the World Bank on uh, infrastructure finance. And, you know, the title of the, of the program today was Asia Urban Spaces local environment and global sustainability, but I, I think that it would be interesting to hear this panel reflect a little bit on uh, the impact of the global environment, and, and some of you have, on local sustainability, and in particular picking up on the point that, that Peter raised. I mean, what, what kind of investment, and, and perhaps here I'm, I'm really uh, uh, directing this to uh, Mr. Detier, uh, what kind of investment are we talking about in order to be able to protect, uh, if you will, the, uh, the local sustainability of cities uh, in an increasingly hostile uh, physical environment. Uh, and you know, what, what kinds of things would we need to do to uh, be able to broaden the sources of financing uh, in order to make that possible, given that it doesn't seem feasible from the standpoint of, of just the USAIDs of the world and the world banks of the world uh, taking this on, even with the best will of, of all of the countries that uh, we participate in. Thank you. And the back there. I'm Frances Lee. I worked for a good many years at USAID and uh, then at uh, the State Department and the National Science Foundation. I have two questions. Um, first, in China, with its huge move toward urbanization, um, don't you think that they have the opportunity uh, in urban design and in building infrastructure to leapfrog some of the 20th century technologies that we have in the cities we're familiar with now that are built. Um, they could be installing much more solar. 
they could have uh, separate water treatment plants for potable water versus other uses of water. Um, the power grid could be designed differently. Perhaps the transportation systems could be designed differently. And um, they are not constrained by the democratic processes, so maybe they could move forward much more aggressively on what uh, their leaders might think is the most enlightened path. That's, of course, somewhat ironic. But, uh, and then the other, the other questions I had were provoked by um, Michael Rock talking about, on the one hand, uh, the 40% the uh, recycled materials or something in the cement, and then the comment that the uh, cement, the Chinese cement, has only half the life expectancy of OECD cement. Uh, what are the implications for the buildings that are being built with this cement? And uh, up here, we have, we'll take two more up here. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Vic Kim, uh, uh, career senior manager at the Environmental Protection Agency, and I've done a fair amount of work in developing countries over the years. Uh, I wonder if we could get the panel to reflect a little bit on what the the donor community could do as this urban expansion takes place to try to s promote the political will to, in fact, be sensitive to minimizing the dislocations among the very poor. There. Last question. I'm Dan Millison. I'm an independent consultant and retired from Asian Development Bank. Uh, Michael, I also had the same question about the cement that she asked, but um, the, the question I wanted to ask, it seemed from Jean-Jacques' presentation, for at least for Multilateral Development Bank, where most of my consulting work is these days, there's some obvious prospects for intervention in lead, you know, green buildings, lead, lead neighborhoods, white roofs, green roofs, this all sounds good, but as far as I know, at least in the Asian Development Bank and IBRD and IFC, there's not much going on, or, or is there in terms of trying to, to develop those kinds of investment programs? And if not, what are some of the barriers or issues that, that need to be addressed? Thanks. Okay. Um, how should we handle this? Uh, let's just go in order and reflect on any questions that you want. Uh, Peter, you want to <laughs> go first? I don't think any of the questions were necessarily directed to, to anybody except for Michael had one on cement. Well, I have a great interest in the, the concept of what, what can the donor community do to affect this problem in a real and serious way. And, and it's my impression that what's happened so far is, is, isn't even close to adequate. And probably a lot more work has been done at the uh, Multina multinational institutions, uh, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and I would be happy to listen for a while to you guys say what you're doing and thinking about it. But it seems that uh, there's a need for a whole new set of institutions and incentives that isn't in place yet. The problems, if the, if the story we've heard this afternoon is true, and I certainly believe it is, we're not getting ready for, for, for what's going to happen. And if you go to work and you work all day long in a development agency and you think you're going to make things better, I think you have to reflect on is what you're going to do really going to make things better or not? Or is, should, we, should most of us be spending a lot of time doing different things? And then I would go in particular to the ideas of policies and incentives and things that change the way people operate and behave. Yeah, uh, let me go quickly over these uh, questions. I mean, uh, first, let's starting with the, the the donor community. Where, what can what can they do uh, to address this issue? Um, you know, f first, in terms of financing, you have to realize that all if you put all eight donors together, which is roughly about 140 billion uh, uh, dollars. I mean, this is a drop in the ocean. I mean, it's, it represents less than 2%, less, much less, I, I think, than, than total investment made in the developing world. You know, so, you know, in terms of 
you know, the, you, so what, what does that mean? You have to be strategic with your investments and you can actually help in other ways. I mean, not so much because you are the only financier, which you can only do in, in very poor country, which cannot access international markets, but because you can add, uh, you know, strategically to private sector investment, for example. Uh, when it comes to issues like climate change and, and a lot of the issues we're talking about, I think what the donor community can do is use its convening power to influence not only the, the affected countries, but also the rich countries, the donor countries themselves. You know, if the United States and other countries started adopting proper policies, for example, that would certainly make a major contribution. I think actually on, on the convening <coughs> power, uh, Warren can talk about that much more expertly than I can. Now on technological catch-up, um, you, you, you asked a question about you know, the you know, human development going hand in hand with, with technological change. Um, you know, this reminds me of the, the debate in the 50s and early 60s. You know, everybody was fixated on famine and food and uh, the planet was not going to have enough food. In fact, if you look at the documents of the World Bank or other organizations at that time, people were writing off Asian countries, Korea and specifically, saying, you know, these guys, I mean, they're ignorant peasants, they're you know, overpopulated countries that are going towards, uh, you know, a disaster. Uh, and the, the countries that they were, you know, highlighting as model countries that represented the future were actually Ghana and, and a lot of African countries. Ghana at, in 1960 had the same per capita GDP as Korea. Look at the you know the, the change. Of course, what happened is technological change. By the way, it's uh, you know largely the the result of the green revolution. Of course, the green revolution means you know pesticides. It means fertilizer, but um, it also means that you know millions of people have improved their lot. And if you look at the poverty uh, figures, actually, specifically in China, in India, and other Asian countries, uh, more than half of the population is now not in poverty, and countries are doing much better than they were before. Now, granted, you know, this obliges you to use massively uh, resources, uh, and, and that is precisely the problem we're dealing with, but uh, what we're dealing with is actually not preventing countries from having the same kind of development than rich countries uh, had uh, in the past, but rather to do the same thing uh, with more efficiently, with, and more efficiently from an environmental point of view. I mean, I think that is the challenge. The, uh, how, how do you do that? I think you do that, uh, you know, in some cases, not always, but with, uh, with pricing mechanism and other market mechanisms, by the way. Uh, or you do that, in my view, and in my view, you know, many donors, including multilateral banks, don't do it enough, uh, by having more proactive government policies. You know, we seem to be very timid about wanting government to move in. Uh, even though we applaud China for doing it. So, I mean, there's some sort of disconnect about what we... Now, the lady was asking about, you know, China leapfrogging. I mean, yeah, that's exactly, I think, what China is doing. But in fact, you find that China, China is definitely the leader on technology like solar. Uh, and it's also the leader in many other uh, environmental technologies much more than uh, European countries or much more than the United States. So it is doing its share. Uh, no, it, it still is one of the largest, you know, the, the biggest emitter, but it's also the biggest country in terms of population and it has the fastest growth rate. So I mean, you cannot reasonably ask them, you know, not to grow 
the way other countries have grown in the past, which means you know, having to use coal, having to use other technologies that we may not like. Uh, several comments. One, on, on cement. My understanding is the weakness of Chinese, Chinese cement has nothing to do with the additives. It has to do with the way of China is not yet at the technological frontier. And so it just doesn't produce the same quality cement, irrespective of the blending of cement. Um, the leapfrog question. Um, my favorite response is Bill Easterly's. People respond to incentives. And if you want to get leapfrog, I, I mean, I, I, I like John's um, presentation of the kinds of things that could be done in urban areas to make urban living and urban design more sustainable. Then you have to ask yourself the question, are there sufficient incentives to get folks to behave that way? And I think probably right now there aren't. Darned. And unless you can change those incentives, you're not going to get the kind of leaf, leaf frog, leapfrog that we would like to have. And finally, on the, on the we're running out of resources kind of thing, uh, I love Herman Daly. Right? And Herman Daly's got a solution to the problem. I don't know how many of you have read his solution to the problem. His solution to the problem is so draconian <laughs> that it doesn't have, I tell my students, doesn't have a proverbial snowball chance in hell of being adopted. <laughs> you know, he wants to put a, he wants some tradable permits in birth rights. He wants to cap the throughput of raw materials on a per capita basis. Uh, he wants there to be a very progressive income tax on the rich in rich countries to the poor in most of the developing countries and to, um, and to the poor in developed countries. You know, if we could do those things, we might get to something that's more sustainable. But it's so unrealistic that I, I, the only hope we, you know, I think about development. Development is about turning natural capital into physical capital and human capital. And that's what we're pinning our hopes on. And Daly says we're flat out wrong. And we may be flat out wrong, but the alternative is so awful. Um, OK, I, first in terms of the leapfrog question, I, um, I think that China, as well as many developing countries, are already leapfrogging. And the reason why I, I say that is I did a study that looked at total final consumption across the board for uh, uh, many, many countries and compared them at similar levels of income. And if you do that, what you'll see is that all the curves <laughs> fall, but the U.S. is on top and then everybody else is underneath, meaning that at any particular level of income, the per capita use of energy, total final consumption, is less than that of the US. In other words, they're more efficient in terms of the way they grow. And certainly that was, uh, that was brought out today in, in Mike's presentation. But the question is, is it enough? Is it, is it enough given the um, condition that we're in? Right? So it, we have to even go further than that. I don't know what we have to do but certainly we need to, as and I think what was really significant about Professor Rock's presentation is just that. We need to go even further. Um, and it has to be much more dramatic if we do want to meet or, let's say, um, avoid some consequences that, that we see. Um, and this gets to that second question about total uh, uh, the, the ecological footprints that you were mentioning. And my guess is that that's what the indicators were, right? So I have a problem with ecological footprinting in general. Um, we could put that aside. But, you know, we live in a globalized world, meaning that, I don't know, between f 25 and 30 percent of GDP is in trade. You know, if you want to talk about international bonds, if you want to talk about the forex uh, markets, they're ginormous, meaning that we are connected internationally. Why do we continually think of nation states as containers? I think what we need to do, and I don't know the answer to your question, but I think what we need to do is to start to really look at this rigorously. 
Now, there are people that are arguing about these teleconnections. And they do this in the uh, climate community. But they're starting to do it with land and particularly in urban teleconnections, meaning that there's some things that happen in this part of the world that affect many other parts of the world. We don't know how that happens. But we have to start thinking in terms of those systems. And then we can start to get to things like, OK, how do you curb impacts based upon these different actions in different types of places? How do we, what would, what would actually be the, uh, the impact of, let's say, some urban design issues in Shanghai to really the consumption levels of those people that live in those places and their impacts in other places? We just don't know. But we need to start to think about that. This is a reorganization of the way we're thinking outside of what the nation state can do and more into how we can directly target cities, maybe city to city interactions, policies, and this gets me to the last question about the donors, is that we really need to, we really need to like, look at cities seriously as entities and start to, um, and I, would, I would just suggest that given what I would consider these overlapping uh, 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 agendas, that we need to look at policies that would actually help in one area, let's say curbing air pollution, that would also curb greenhouse gas emissions. What works, what doesn't work? So we need to look at policies that will cross scales and actually cross sectors. I think there's a lot of talk about this. I don't think there's a lot been done you know, uh, uh, in this regard, and I think we have to start doing that. And that particularly, in my point of view, would be really w where you get your biggest bang for the buck. Okay. I mean, as moderator, I'm going to play panelist uh, and, and comment on three, three of these. First, uh, on the natural resources <coughs> issue, I, I also don't have an answer, but I do think that a big gap is the fact that we don't account for what we have. We don't put values on it, and we don't have an accounting system that measures what we have, what our assets are, and how we use them. So that is a major step that uh, needs to be taken. GDP is not a great measure uh, of real wealth. And, and until we get some kind of, of uh, natural capital accounting in place, uh, we're not going to know what our assets are or, or how we use them or misuse them. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in that area right now. Um, impact of global on local. Uh, just a quick answer the, is uh, our estimates are between that, that to put the infrastructure in place for future populations is going to cost 10 to 30 percent more. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know what it's going to cost, uh, so we don't know what we're multiplying by uh, 1.1 or 1.3. Uh, and I, I think that's another big gap in the, in the, the knowledge base. Um, on, I'm going to come to the donors last. On the green buildings, IFC actually has a new initiative. They've got a team that's only focused on green buildings. A lot of the work's in India right now. Uh, I think they're doing some really uh, cool stuff. And, uh, and I think this is going to be the, the new energy, uh, we didn't call it a strategy. I don't remember what we called, what was approved by our, or endorsed by our board uh, last week, does have a strong focus on energy efficient buildings uh, uh, for the bank. And I think that's going to be a major part of our, uh, business and finally on the donor what the donor community can do I think first off we need to uh, you know absolutely correct if you look at conventional donor uh, uh, inputs in developing countries compared to foreign direct investment it's a drop in the bucket but it can do a lot of things but first we have to redefine donors because countries are no longer the predominant donors necessarily I think that that one of the key steps for cities is to recognize that cities are donors and that we have to start looking at things like initiatives like the C40 and, and others and actually build on those so that, so that urban leadership can play the future role that, that quite frankly, national leadership has not been playing that need and fill that gap. Um, the second issue there is that, uh, for the World Bank anyway, we have a big problem because we can't do sub-sovereign or we don't effectively do sub-sovereign lending. There would be those who argue that we can, uh, and the day that it happens, I'll say we can. But as of right now, I don't think we can. Um, and, and so, you know, recognizing that working at the city level is absolutely critical in the future, and, and then adjusting our own, at least in the World Bank, adjusting our policy base, our policy framework, uh, what regulates us, so that we can actually do some serious work at that level, 
will make a, a big uh, dent, I think. And there, and it's mainly policy. It's not doing projects. It's about policy reform, institutional reform, and so on. So we've got, uh, Owen, oh, how are we doing time-wise? Well, we're doing okay on time. I'm just wondering uh, if I can just resume uh, to make a couple of comments rather than at the very end that might provoke some, some additional conversation. Go for it. I'm Owen Silkey. I'm with the you say the Alumni Association. So you can tell from up here, it's the Alumni Association. We're uh, not USAID, uh, but we were USAID, and 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 we think about uh, development. We've been sponsoring. Uh, we've come to a decision to sponsor a series of workshops, together with uh, Wilson in, in, in this case, um, uh, on uh, or the urbanization phenomenon. And there's a number of organizations, some of which represented here today. The Atlantic Council is doing some work around there, this. Uh, Brookings Institution is doing some, some really good work. Um, uh, USAID itself, with its Making Cities work, uh, is, is doing some, some good work. And of course, Blair, the, the work that Allison and yourselves are, are, are doing here. But we come with a very distinctive uh, thought, and, and, and it, it is the relationship of urbanization to development, and not looking at it as a sector. To me, urban is a sector, and so we worry about how do we build uh, better transportation systems or this or that or the other thing. But urbanization is a development process. And it seems to me just right off, right, right off the bat, the first lesson, if I put on different hats and say, I'm USAID, what am I learning out of these kinds of workshops? It's urbanization is the issue. It's not just how do we do urban services, how do we provide an urban this or an urban that. Urbanization process. The world's gonna live in urban cities and uh, I, I came to aid in 1960s uh, with a green perspective. Everything was rural, it was green. It was, it was as how do we do rural development? And frankly, I don't think the mentality at the agency or, or a lot of agencies has really changed to understand that urban isn't just another thing. It is development in, anymore. It's the way in which people are gonna live. And I think that's almost one of the first lessons for, for you say. The second is why Mike Rock is, 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 is here. Somehow industrialization is left out. No, no one's worrying about industrialization, but it's central to our understanding of what's happening in, in, in cities. Call it economics, if you will, if you don't want to call it industrialization. Call it employment, call it productivity, call it economic growth, call it whatever, whatever you want. But a strategy which simply looks at providing urban services and doesn't look at the economic function of cities, it seems to me totally misses the ball game. And this is really an important lesson, I think, for, uh, for USAID. We, did a workshop uh, recently on uh, what we call the urban imperative for, for, for rural societies in Africa to move to off-farm employment, urban em 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 employment. And in this case, the opposite end of, this, of the spectrum, the kind of damage uh, that, that uh, industrialization, um, economic activity can mean for the environment. Um, and, and so this notion of incorporating within urbanization a real concern for economic activity and how it takes place and what, what, what it means. The, 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 the greater part of the urban environmental phenomenon that we've talked about today is urban infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's what Mike is, Mike is talking about, and yet it's not part and parcel of the urban debate in most of the development organizations, it seems to me. So that's, that's one's two, two observations I like to make. Second, I think there's really an important obs observation for the State Department and for the Defense Department. You know, Hillary Clinton talks about the three Ds, defense, development, and diplomacy. Well, for, 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 for state, it seems to me, and for aid in a certain sense, science and, te and technology. AID has a science and technology. Administrators talked about science and technology, and um, uh, the State Department has a whole, de a whole department and an assistant secretary devoted to science and, and technology. But I've been working with the National Academy of Sciences on some of AIDS, AIDS programs with these peer things. These tiny little educational, different, different kinds of technology activities, funding them. Rather than coming to grips with the technological process, which is what, what Mike's talking about, if, if, if we don't reduce the amount of pollution, waste, resource throughput, energy per unit of output, per unit of prosperity, per unit of growth, this environmental sustainability thing is just going to over is just going to overwhelm us, and and I hear you you uh, this question down here because I don't think we've talked enough about biodiversity um, uh, t today and, and and the impact on natural resources as as they throw through the industrial process. But it does seem to me that science and technology is in critically important. AID and 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 I think the department sometimes are fooling around with this issue. 
when it's central to the issue. So that's another lesson I'd like to uh, throw out. Thirdly, uh, a colleague from Atlantic Council, Peter Angelke, at, at the back of the room, we, we had breakfast the other morning, and he pointed out to me, there's a fundamental shift that has to happen at, at state. They have to start dealing with cities. It's wonderful to have these negotiations going on, nation state to nation state, Geneva meetings on climate change. The answer to these questions, the challenge of these questions are in cities, which are powerful, which are empowered, and it's gonna really change the way in which diplomacy is done. Engaging with cities, not just nation state to nation state. That's the way we've done it for 100 years, but these cities are, as, as we've seen, they are the future. That, that's the way the world is gonna be organized. That's the way governments are gonna be organized. And we see it now in the streets in Rio. We see it with, uh, with, uh, in, in the streets of Islamabad in Karachi. Um, that, that these cities are going to define almost our security understanding of the world as it comes, as it comes into the past. And we're going to do it with Peter Amato, we're going to do a, a workshop on, on this whole issue of crime in cities, urban unrest in cities, uh, radicalization in, in, in cities. So I just wanted to mention that if I can. When, when we thought of this workshop, there were two things that occurred to me, and I want to come back to the gentleman on sustainable, uh, sustainability here. I was thinking very much of biodiversity and climate change against kind of pollution and waste at the local, at the local level. And you have the international community worrying very much about climate change, worrying about biodiversity and these kinds of issues. But these issues aren't going to get solved if we can't clean up the garbage in the cities. Of, there's no reason why citizens of these cities are going to pay any attention to our global kinds of concerns if we don't have a concern for what happens in their very backyards. And so my general point on this would, would, would be that the global sustainability agenda, not just the city sustainability agenda, but the global sustainability agenda has to take account of what's happening in the local environmental kind of, kind of condition. And in fact, many of those things are linked. And Mike, I'm surprised you, you, you didn't talk a little bit. You talked a lot about, we've been in business together for 35 years, but you talked a lot about the in, in industry and in, in energy. But the industrial process is made up of things that have impacts on waste, on pollution, on energy, on resource throughput. And a focus on the industrial process writ large, it seems to me, rather than a stovepipe look at energy alone or waste alone, uh, really, really misses the way in which the industrial process uh, takes place. And I'd, I'd like to see you comment on that. And particularly, coming back to your comment too, I've seen recent statistics that show that the intensity of natural resource throughput in, in industry is actually exploding up where it is going down on, on, on the energy side, which seems to me suggests a look at the industrial process itself. Um, and we can take a lot of, a lot of joy out of what's happening perhaps with, with energy, but it ain't happening with biodiversity and with, with the kinds of issues I think you were raising uh, down, down, down here. A final comment, if I had a, or just one more if I can, just take advantage of where I'm standing, is um, cities. Uh, we circulated and there's been circulating around in the, in the literature now this whole question of the global competitiveness of cities. Cities are actually competing with each other for uh, economic activity, for, 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 for investment. And part of that competition is going to be based on the environment. We see it certainly in companies. We see Samsung and other big Asian multinationals that are competing today on their environmental kind of quality. And it seems to me this is, this is going to be part and parcel of it. We understand cities as economic entities, going back to my point that we have to think about the economics. These cities are also in competition one with another. And an important element of, of uh, economic competitiveness is going to be probably environmental as we look out into the future. And the last item, I guess, just before I sit down, is to say that partnership is going to be incredibly important um, between industry and, and business. And, and I've always been struck by how the, how the environmental movement came to the United States and, and how so many of us think this way. It came out of a health kind of concern and the government and civil society coming together to really clamp down on industrial development. But in most Asian cities, the country is run by business in concert with governments. And so how do, you, how do you really take account of that kind of particular political economy in, in trying to come to, to come to grips with what's out there? All of this meaning we have to think more and more about the way in which we're going to live, to think about not the urban sector, but urbanization as a process. And it seems to me that's what we're really trying to get across, and that's what I like to say to my, our successors at, at, at AID as, as, as they try to come to grips with this problem. It can't just be on the long list of priorities that, it, that AID wants to deal with. It has to be central to how they understand the world and development uh, as we look forward. So 
That's my two cents. Oh, and partnership. I wanted to thank the Wilson Institute. That's really was, was the whole point. I think, Blair, I really value what, what you guys have contributed to this, but give, giving us a platform, we alumni who are wandering the streets look, looking for a platform <laughs> to speak to these issues. It's been a tremendous kind of partnership, so many thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Owen, and we look forward to seeing you on the streets. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I know. You're going to join us, yeah. Uh, we've got about uh, 15 minutes, I think, for discussion, and then I want to give each of the panelists a minute to, uh, to, for their final thought. Uh, so let's take three and then go with the flow. One, two, and three. Yes, um, Peter Romato, uh, USAID uh, alumni. Um, I want to follow up on Owen's point, particularly on urbanization as a process. And here I want to look at this question of industrialization. And I think the gentleman here well spoke of this industrial process and the whole question of tying it in with pollution, the CO2 emissions, et cetera, et cetera. But the one area that I really feel is missing here, and this gets to the whole urbanization process, is what's happening in these industries. They're not in the cities. They're outside the cities. And what's going on? And I don't know if any of you have seen this latest article here, China's Bad Earth. Uh, this just appeared in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend. Let me just read you just a caption here. It says, industrialization has turned much of Chinese countryside into an environmental disaster zone, threatening not only the food supply, but the legitimacy of the regime itself. And this gets to the sec security issues. This is a tie back to the urban, because the urban populations now, very different than in the past, and we're talking about in China and many other countries in the world, are more and more dependent, they don't grow their own food, on the countryside. You get contamination, and what it's saying here is that probably you've got 20%, close to 20% of a lot of the, of the rural landscape where it's been producing food is contaminated with heavy metals. This is a problem. And although you, know, you talked about the CO2 emissions, here is you have soil contamination coming from industries, and yet what how do you address these? With cities now, people no longer can grow their own food. It's not the good earth that was written many years ago by Paul Buck on the good earth back in 1931, looking at the rural population and their dependency on, on the land. The Chinese no longer, in many other countries, populations are no longer dependent on the land. But cost, and in terms of the food security and safety of food. We know it here in the States, where our, some of our food's coming in from. There are food issues. That can be a major disruptive point, and I just you know, raise that to all of you, how you think that could, should be addressed. Thank you. Okay. And we have, yes. Frederica Kramer, independent consultant, um, and I do teach urban policy from time to time. Um, I didn't hear a lot of discussion uh, about the objectives of urbanization in terms of spatial allocation of populations um, and um, in, the, in the context of this enormous growth. Great cities historically, at least from a Western perspective, are cities of diversity, and the diversity uh, generally uh, means diversity, uh, interaction of diverse populations. There, it seems to me, either are or not lessons from, the, uh, from Western urbanization and U.S. urbanization from uh, aggressive growth that resulted in, um, in extreme income and social uh, segregation patterns. Uh, so I guess my question to the panelists is what are people thinking about uh, in terms of, uh, of Asian urbanization and um, are these just old uh, old-fashioned ideas about what cities really mean or, or, or need to mean, particularly in this, uh, I mean, the scale, as you've described correctly, the scale of, of Asian urbanization is something unmatched uh, in, in uh, Western urbanization. And the last one here. 
Hi, Jen Rivers, Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure. Um, I'd like to go back to the idea of resiliency, which a couple of the speakers have mentioned. Um, we've also been talking about how technology is, is leapfrogging. Maybe we're getting to lower carbon technologies a lot quicker. But in the idea of resiliency, how are these big cities with population, massive populations in um, areas that are low-lying, prone to climate change-related issues, how are they addressing resiliency to disasters? Okay, what, uh, we'll start Ooh. this side this time. <laughs> okay, um, really, really good questions, some tough ones. Um, let, in terms of the urbanization process, I am a complete, I'm in complete agreement with this. We recently published a paper sort of arguing for an urban science, urbanization science, because we really don't understand the urbanization process very well. What are the components? How does it operate? How does it interact with other systems at all scales, including the global sale, et cetera, et cetera? We want to get away from the urban studies looking at individual places and look more at urbanization at regional, if not, if not a global scale, and how, how that system operates. Because I don't think we know, honestly. And I think that is part of what the era that we're in and, um, and, and obviously going to be necessary for um, moving towards sustainability because, as I mentioned, I don't think that we could start, we could look at places and say, oh, let's make this city low carbon, let's make this, you know, the urban design, we'll put some nice trees in, we'll bring in biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera, because we don't know what the impact of doing those policies are on other places, right? Some, some of them could have positive feedback that would be good things, many of them would not be, i.e., the relocation of industries outside of cities, making your city less uh, pollutant, less, let's say, more uh, energy efficient, but uh, still depending upon those resources in other places. And I honestly think that this is uh, an area for academics that, um, that, that needs to be done, absolutely. Um, biodiversity. I uh, was telling uh, Owen before I came here, I did a very sort of um, splash and dash analysis. I took the UN data for 2000 to 2100 by country because they've already done the predictions. I took the median variant and I said by country I'll spread population out evenly, I, although it's very clustered, we know this. And then I looked at it by latitude and how it changed by latitude. Why latitude? Because there is something called the biological uh, gradient that biological diversity increases as you go towards the equator. Right. Now, arguably, in a very crude estimation, most of the world's population is located between, right now, between, let's say, 17 degrees north and 50 degrees north, right? Latitude, and, um, uh, you know, obviously that we consume uh, products and that impacts biodiversity, but, the, but that global population is located there. If you believe the UN data, by 2100, it will be bimodal with a larger group of people located between 15 degrees north and 10 degrees south, approximately. What's that going to do? Because these people are going to be located in the areas of major biodiversity. I think this is a, this for me was very, very enlightening, and I don't think that people understand what future population is going to do. Now, that means to me that not only is technology and lowering per capita impact important, but we have to really do some rethinking about how we do things. I don't think, I, I wonder if the Earth can support that type of population. And, and that population distribution, by the way. So right now we're in the, we're in the process of, being, of refining that to looking more closely at what that would mean when we aggregate these people to cities. Um, Last comment, very quickly, about the environmental movement. Um, the way I understand the environmental movement in the U.S. is through uh, er environmental historians like Joel Tarr, Martin Melosi, Samuel Hayes, and that, you know, it was like health, beauty, permanence, right? Sort of these types of issues over time that, that the middle class came to understand as important 
as they worked less, made more money, et cetera, et cetera, and then understood that the very technologies that they thought were um, helpful became actually problems for the environment. The classic one that Joel Tarr always talks about is the automobile, which was actually a health solution, right? Because cities, as we saw put up uh, by um, uh, my colleague, had lots of horses in them. Horses had emissions. These emissions created health problems, and people, uh, and the horses died sometimes, and they weren't carted away. Children played around them, et cetera, et cetera. The automobile was touted by uh, health officials to be very, very important because they would take those horses off the street, right? And you'd put it in this car or automobile that seemingly had no emissions, right? So there's all these unintended consequences later on down the road, <coughs> oh my goodness, now we have to deal with this. The same thing, and you could look at this through, you could look at this through the uh, various different environmental issues. Often solutions to the problems became problems in the next generation, what we call sometimes path dependency or there was a certain amount of lock-in once you started doing this. Um, which makes, and, and so that's, that's the way we developed. Right? If you look to the east, I think it's completely different there. I think the motivators are different. I think the political actors are different, et cetera. So what we had experienced and why we had done things is no longer applicable there. We need to generate new models in order to understand actually how to get, to move these things forward. Certainly, um, I, again, I'm going to come back to this. I think we need to do this cross-sector and cross-scale. Uh, how to do that and get, how to get the political sort of agenda behind that is an open question. Mike? I'm going at this an entirely different way. I'm going to look for a moment at the economic miracles in East Asia. Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and now China. What was the biggest driver of their success? My answer, elite, political elite leadership commitment to development and to a trial and error strategy to figure out what works and to go with it and also to figure out how to dump what doesn't work. So you had Suharto in uh, Indonesia, the father of Indonesian development, a son of a bitch, but, a, but the father of Indonesian development. You had Park Chung-hee in Korea. Another son of a bitch. Another big son of a bitch, right? <laughs> uh, and these folks came to see their long-run political survival tied up with developmental success. Okay, what's the lesson for me? We need to find mayors for whom sustainable city development is tied up with their long-run success. I would find them, and I would fund them to the fare they will. <laughs> uh, and if you don't do that, to talk in the abstract, I think, is really, really hard. And I think the problems are hard. It's easy in Singapore. Oh, and you and I once did a study in Singapore. We looked at uh, Jurong Town Corporation, the Ministry of Environment, and the Industrial Development Board. We even came up with this, uh, this little phrase, policy integration, how the environment was mainstreamed there. And it was. But you know what? Who was the originator of that? Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew. <laughs> and how did Lee Kuan Yew get to it? Uh, my good friend at... Uh, uh, God, at the London School of Economics, Bob Way. His father was, uh, what was, High Commissioner. And he told Robert a story. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew went to his Minister of Housing and said to his minister at one point, where have all the birds gone? <laughs> and the minister said, we've cut down all the trees and the birds are gone. Now, Singapore is a garden city now. Lee Kuan Yew made it a garden city. By the way, he created an anti-pollution unit in the prime minister's office in 1963. He created a ministry of the environment in 1965. He required OECD multinationals to meet wastewater emissions, air emissions, uh, and toxic emissions standards, what little they existed, uh, in the OECD. And as Owen knows, we, I, I've got a, we've got a chapter in a book on this. A multinational couldn't get a flatted factory in Singapore 
unless it met the requirements of the Ministry of the Environment. So it's now totally sui generis, right? Two and a half million people, maybe it's three and a half million people. Now go to Bangkok, right? Bangkok is one of your megalopolises. Why does Bangkok look the way it looks? If you're anybody in anybody in, in Thailand, you want to be in Bangkok. You don't want to be posted out to one of the provinces. There's, there are nobodies. You know, provincial governors have no power. You know, if you're in the if you're in the ministry of whatever in in upcountry and you want to requisition a tablet, you don't have a budget to buy a tablet. I don't know if this is still true, but it used to be true. You had to send something to the central ministry in Bangkok. So what you've got is what, 40, 50 percent of Thailand's GDP is in Bangkok? Almost all the export platform is around Bangkok. Uh, they built this eastern seaboard thing. Um, except for one uh, mayor, I don't know that there have been anybody, uh, any other mayors in Bangkok who have really, uh, you know, the Thais don't play it. So, but you got a uh, long-winded and nutsy story here, but, but you, you, you have to have leadership commitment. And you have to build on what you got. And you have to be willing to experiment. It's a great story. <laughs> so I w I w let me continue a little bit on that. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, leadership. I mean, I very much agree with Warren's point and your point that, you know, city leadership is important. You mentioned uh, C40. And in fact, we, we do have some mayors who are a bit like, uh, like, like those heads of state of, uh, of Asia. I mean, you have the mayor of Curitiba, you have uh, Bogota, you have, uh, uh, you know, at some point in Italy, uh, Naples. Um, in, in fact, there, there's, there are a few uh, good, uh, good political economy books on cities, uh, city mayors, uh, you know, one of which talks about the demise of the party machines, you know, which were actually very important in the West to, in, you know, in cities like New York and, or, or Chicago, and are now talking about what they call uh, branding of cities. Um, you know, some mayors who have made their city, like Naples, when the G20 was, uh, uh, you know, took place in Naples, uh, who have uh, made their city uh, something and uh, that led to you know gave gave the city certainly much more importance and leads to the some something that owen mentioned which is the, the the competitiveness of of cities i mean now a lot of cities are actually uh, basically fighting for to to get uh, uh, FDI to get uh, talent, uh, and that that drives a lot of the of the process. Uh, anyway, so that's my my two cents worth. Um, quickly to answer the question about uh, Western cities and diversity, I mean, I guess you you mean um, ethnic diversity and and yeah, I mean I you know I don't have an answer except that of course I mean that's largely driven by uh, you know, labor movement. I mean, diversity in Europe, for example, is certainly not something that the the Europeans wanted, but it's the result of labor shortages in the the 1960s, which has led to an uh, influx of uh, of labor force. Uh, Asian cities have much less uh, have been much less inclined to to accept uh, foreign labor. In fact, some of them are have very little. Uh, Japan, uh, even China or uh, or Korea have very little uh, foreign labor force, except of course um, the the labor force that was there originally. For example, the Chinese minorities, which were very important in the in the development of these cities, and we all know how in Indonesia, for example, uh, that has not gone down uh, very well. On, on resiliency to disaster, the question you asked, um, you know, it's interesting that now, I mean, certainly at the World Bank, and I, I would imagine that in other uh, uh, development banks, uh, issues of disaster, risk management for, for cities or for, 
for countries has probably become the most dynamic uh, aspect of the portfolio. I mean, certainly the, the growing business is in resiliency, uh, not only as a result of, uh, of disasters like uh, you know, floods and, uh, and, and the like, uh, but also because of the issues we're talking about and the need to manage in a coordinated fashion the risk uh, of these cities. Uh, it's, it's the largest part of the portfolio. And in fact, uh, I just wanted to say the, the, the one thing we have not talked about today is the, the financing aspect. Uh, um, Owen, you have mentioned a little bit saying, you know, we should move towards sub-sovereign lending. You're absolutely right. In fact, we, we do it a little bit when it comes to states in federal countries. Uh, most organizations do not lend to cities. But then on the other hand, you know, cities are not politically the main actors generally. I mean, the, and I think that is what, what is driving the, when the World Bank lends, uh, they lend with a guarantee and the guarantee comes from the government. It doesn't come from the state of Maharashtra or, or, or from, uh, you know, the state of Minas Gerais. I mean, the, it comes from the, the country itself. And cities, um, you know, you need the, the financing generally are, you know, financing packages put together by the cities with the private sector, with donors very in, in some occasions, and also with public, uh, public funds from the central government. I think the, what we have to, to move towards are, you know, flexible financing packages uh, PPP, uh, private uh, public partnerships have often been touted as, you know, the answer. But frankly, when you look at the evidence, I mean, it's not really an answer from, for the critical problems. You, you see a lot of PPP in, in energy, for example, in telecom, but they're concentrated in seven countries who are essentially the BRIC uh, countries, not, not the other countries. And, uh, and usually PPPs don't touch critical things like healthcare, education, uh, wastewater, uh, even waste. Uh, so I, I think this is you know, something that needs to be, uh, to be thought through. Okay. Peter, you have the last word. Okay. <clears throat> the, I'd say that we haven't spoken enough and because the subject matter is so complex but about uh, governance, and, and, and there's a major area of intervention by, by donors and by civil society, people interested in international affairs, that decisions have to be made, made in how to manage these, these terrible problems that are coming down the way, and that the donor community could focus on governance as a major item. I also say in passing that uh, even within the existing system which required uh, the loans to be guaranteed by the nation, most of the good projects that we did at AID over the years came in partnership with a mayor, that is the urban projects. That when you found a mayor that thought the way, the, you found more mayors thought in a solid developmental sense than you found ministers of construction or ministers of finance. So uh, we are out of time. Uh, you're going to wrap up? No. Okay. I'm going to wrap up very quickly, but I, I do want to end up in a place where Peter just uh, directed us. When I go back and think about what we heard, um, clearly we as a species are facing a world we, don't, we can't recognize because the challenges are unprecedented. And there are three dimensions of change which came up which are interrelated, and it has to do with climate and urbanization and technological change. And we need to wrap our minds around these three dimensions in totally new ways. Now, that's a daunting task, except human beings probably have often felt that they had to think about the world in new ways because they were facing unprecedented problems. I'm sure that. Uh, an East Anglican farmer in 1750 looking at the growth of London, if you told him what the world was going to look like in 1850 or 1950, 
would have been overwhelmed. Uh, and I think that this is the reason why I'm somewhat left. Um, I want to end on an optimistic note, but an optimistic note with some caution. We need to think about these problems differently, and we will, because ultimately, for the reasons you heard, we have no choice. The world is going to change, and we need to go about our business differently, and we need to go about our business in a way which recognizes the realities of climate change. I know we're not supposed to use that word here in Washington, but there is a reality out there. Um, I have close relatives in the state of North Carolina where it's illegal to measure the sea level, but I can guarantee you the sea level is going to do what the sea level is going to do, no matter what the legislature in Raleigh says. We have to deal with this new urban reality, which really is a game changer. And it's a game changer everywhere. And we can't just take old Western models and extrapolate into the future. We have to recognize that there is something qualitatively different happening. And obviously, we all live every day with, with changes in technology. And we see the impact of those changes already in political life around the world. And we see the impacts of a growing middle class around the world. So we need to rethink these things. And at the one uh, note I wanted to end up on is to go back to the issue of leadership and governance. Um, and, and bring in diversity as well. We're dealing in a, with very complex situations in which one size doesn't fit all. And you do need to have to think about a process of interacting with the reality on the ground. And leadership is very important. There's no doubt about it. But a few years ago, I wrote a, a book about three great cities in the midst of their, of, at the time, the ra most rapid transformation of cities that had ever taken place. I wrote about Chicago, Moscow, Osaka, 1870 to 1920. They had great leaders. They had fantastic mayors, the kinds of mayors you could go in and talk to who were doing great things. And yet, at the end of the story stood Tojo, Lenin, and Al Capone. What went wrong? What went wrong was they didn't get the governance structures right. They didn't institutionalize the processes by which change can take place. A leader can be very important, but ultimately there is a political process which has to come into our analysis as well. And that has to do with building institutions which are flexible enough to respond to the unprecedented challenges we're talking about. So I'll put on my political science hat here and say this has been really fantastic. Fortunately, we haven't answered all the questions. And we're going to have to come back again and pick up, a, pick up a number of streams. But seriously, this has really been a great, great panel. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I like your thinking on just about everything. <laughs> <Not true. laughs>